We're on. All right. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here, for sticking around, for being part of it. I'm Dr. Marcy, just in case we haven't met before. And we're actually going to start by diving in headfirst into an experience of being, because the title of this TEDx idea shop is we need to be more to be more. So for a few minutes, we're going to be and then we'll get into the understanding of it. But you've been listening so much and doing so much today. So if you will just go down the rabbit hole with me quickly, put your hands on your heart, find a comfortable seat. Ideally, your feet are flat on the floor and not crossed, but it's more important that you are comfortable than in any position that I tell you to be in. And as you take a deep breath in, if it feels good to you, close your eyes just so that you can be in your own little world. And I want you to think about all that has already happened today and pick just one thing that was really good, a solid good moment, a solid good experience that you're like, yeah, if that happened again tomorrow and the next day and the next day, be a good life. And as you think about that really good moment, and take slow, deep breaths with your hands on your heart. Smile to yourself that you got to have that good moment today. And now I want you to think about another moment that happened today. A moment that brought in inspiration. A moment that lit a little fire of curiosity under you. Something that sparked something that went, ah. Maybe there's more for me to learn here. Maybe there's something different for me to experience, but just this little bit of inspiration that was brought into your life today. Just one moment of that. And as you think about that moment, smile to yourself because you got to be inspired. And for one final thought, I want you to come up with something that you're really grateful for that happened today. Something that made your life better. Now that might be your morning cup of coffee. It can be simple and easy. It might be having seen somebody that you love deeply and telling them that you love them because those moments are precious and being grateful for them is important or it might have been being around somebody that you love and them telling you that they love you because those are also really powerful, magical moments. And as you think of whatever this moment is that you're grateful for, take a deep breath and smile to yourself that you got to have that experience for you today. And let all of that just settle with your hands in your heart, breathing in a way that is slow and comfortable as we settle into our time together. And when you're ready, because there's no rush, slowly open your eyes, take your hands down, and welcome. So, I am a behaviorist by trade. My day-to-day -day is usually telling people what to do and how to do and what to say and how to say it, usually around families to make things happier and better in there. And yet today, our time together is going to be about being, which is a really fun twist for me. So I wanna to talk to you about that because I have started a practice of being, where for 30 minutes a day, I sit in that orange chair over there and, and that's about it. I just sit there and do nothing. I realized that if I was here and had you sit and do nothing with me, that would be a very, very strange experience and you'd all close your computer and leave. So we're not doing that, have no fear. But what I realized is that that time that I spend every day, that 30 minutes is changing my life. It is bringing in so much good and so much different and so much, so much that I wanted to share that with you. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about why I spend so much time being, why I think maybe you might want to spend some more time being, but mostly we're going to spend most of our time actually in the beingness so that you can experience it together. So let me back up a little bit and, and start with the fact that I am a very good doer. You might also be a very good doer because we as a culture are very, very good at doing things. You need some Ikea put furniture put together. I am your girl. You have a behavior problem. Like, let me show up and help you take care of it. You have someone who needs to, to have a difficult conversation. Let's, let's go. I'm ready. I'll hold your hand. Let's dive in. By the time I was 29, I had my doctorate and written two books. Like, I can do things. But a year and a half ago, when everything kind of stopped, I realized that that doing only filled me up so much and that that external validation from all of the people around me was amazing. And it is what I lived on and it's what kept me going and doing and doing and doing. But it was also kind of exhausting and exhausting and exhausting. And then when I couldn't go do all of the things, you couldn't have me over to put together a, a desk that you needed or I couldn't show up, right? One of my favorite parts of speaking was that 30 minutes after you spoke, when you would talk to the organizers and they would share how everything went in their perspective and you would talk to the people who were listening and hear their questions or their stories or how it impacted them, that was all gone. And I realized that without that, I didn't really feel very worthy of anything. I didn't know how to listen to the voice inside of me. I didn't know how to listen to my own inspiration. And so I had a practitioner recommend that I start sitting and she told me to do nothing, that I was doing too much and it wasn't filling me back up. And hence I was experiencing depression. So I started sitting and doing nothing, as she said, which I have now reframed being because it just feels better to me and that language feels important. So I spend time being every day and realized that so many of us don't do that. I wonder if you are really good at doing and doing for others and feeling filled up by doing for others all the time. But when it comes to yourself, when it comes to the stories in your own head, when it comes to your own inner wisdom, you don't really know how to sit and just be with yourself. So I needed to find a way to listen to myself. And this, this sitting and being was really the answer for me. So I'm doing more and more of it and it is changing my life. What I realized is that in the world, the more popular term for being is mindfulness. And there's all this amazing research, amazing research out there that talks about how mindfulness helps mental health, right? It can help with anxiety and depression and overwhelm and burnout, all of these amazing, amazing things. It can also help with physical ailments, right? M mindfulness practices help lower blood pressure. When people are having panic attacks, to breathe is part of the solution. So I realized that while being isn't always how people do mindfulness practices, there are lots of ways to do it. This was mine. And it's kind of amazing. But there are a few reasons for this, my, for this being practice in the particular way that I do it that I wanted to highlight. And one is that we are so good at consuming information. We are so good at whether it is from social media, whether it is from a TV show, whether it is from TEDx events, we have become consumers of so much information. And when we have downtime, when we rest, when we relax, we're consuming somebody else's thoughts. We're consuming somebody else's ideas. And this time for being is about not taking more in, about connecting with the ideas in your own head, in your own being, because there's so much wisdom in you, so much wisdom in me that I've been finding. It's been great. The second is in our head, there's all sorts of people's voices that aren't ours, be it the encouragement of a parent, be it the voice of a teacher. And sometimes those voices are wonderful and uplifting, though not yours. And sometimes those voices are not so uplifting or kind because those people were doing the best they could, but weren't so kind to us. 
And this time of being is a time to let go of all of those voices, all of what other people think you should or shouldn't or can or cannot do and find your own voice. Because I've learned that I can do a lot more than I ever thought I could. But I had to believe in myself and I had to go against the grain. I had to make it up myself in so many ways. And in this time of being, it is where I found that. It is where I found my little nuggets of inspiration to say, ah, oh, that's a great idea. Let me go do it. And that's everything from getting out my sketch pad and drawing to writing a book. It all came from that inspiration in me, not what other people told me to do because they don't necessarily know what's right. And my favorite example of that is that for years, I have been told to do a TEDx talk for years. And I was never ready till now. Other people didn't see that. They wanted me to talk about all sorts of things. But this, this information, this talking about being, this sharing my own sense of beingness feels like the most important message that I could share. And so it wasn't right till it was right. So hence why we're here now. So the other people's voices in your head, not consuming all of the content. But then the third reason that being is so powerful to me is that it lets me synthesize all that information. I am a chronic learner. I will geek out on how to run a business. I will geek on how to change behavior. I will geek out on all sorts of things, human about how to be a better human. Because I kind of think that's what we're here for. But when I'm constantly learning, I never have time to integrate it. Or I never actually took the time to integrate it is a better way to say it, because I was just constantly learning the next and the next and the next and the next and the next, when really I needed to stop and say, how do I apply that? How do I put that into practice? And maybe more importantly, do I want to put that into practice? Or is that somebody else's idea that was great for them, but it's not mine? The things that we learn, we have to decide for ourselves, do I want to try it? Do I want to commit to it? Or do I want to say, thank you, no. That's your journey, not mine. And I, when I was in my phase of really doing so, so much, I got really good at doing other people's actions that weren't meant to be mine. So another reason why we're gonna be together and practice this space of being is because there is inner wisdom. We all have brilliance inside of us. We all can move mountains and change lives and whatever your dreams are, you can make that happen. But we can't do any of that if we don't take time to listen to that inner wisdom. So for me, part of it was that when I started this practice of being, what I kept hearing was that I needed to spend more time listening to myself. That's what I kept hearing. And so the more I did it, the more my entire system said, do this more, do this more, do this more. So I said, okay, clearly this is what I need to be doing. Let's do this more. And it has served me so, so well because I got a lot of intelligence in here but if I'm not listening to myself, I can't use any of it. You have a lot of intelligence in there. And if you're not listening to it, if you're constantly in motion doing, you don't know what you don't know. And so taking this time really serves to allow you to be clear on what is your next step? What is the right move? And what is somebody else's story and somebody else's plan for you that actually is not in alignment? Because I don't want to live somebody else's life. I want to live mine. I want to see what your life is. And I want us together to create an amazing world. Now, the final piece of why being has been such a powerful experience for me is about community and thinking about reflecting on the past year and a half. There have been so many times where I just wanted to be with loved ones. I just wanted to be with my family and couldn't. I just wanted to be with beloved friends and I couldn't. And so I realized that as I started practicing being, when I was actually able to be back with people I loved, I was more present. I was more able to focus and I cared less about what we did together 
and could actually just show up and be there with them. My own practice of being allowed me to enjoy when I actually was able to connect with those we love. And it feels to me like one of the messages that we have gotten loud and clear is that spending quality time with people we love is one of the whole reasons that we are on this planet. Because I can remember the first time my mom hugged me after lockdown. I can remember the first time my dad hugged me after lockdown. But I have no idea what we did together because that didn't matter. And you may have loved ones where you wanted to get together and bake together or you wanted to do a jigsaw puzzle together or you wanted to go play baseball or football or something together. My belief around that is that those actions, that doing is how you knew how to be together. It's a ritual we created because we don't always know how to be. Now, the final piece of community um, is a little tender on my heart, but feels really important to mention, is the power of being with, with those who are passing. For so many of us on the past year and a half, we have lost loved ones that we were not able to be with. And I lost a very dear friend this week who was so beloved and I was not able to be with her from the time she was sick to the time that she passed. And when I thought about what I wanted, what did I want to do? I really just wanted to go be with her and hold her hand and memorize the curves of her face and sit there while she was sleeping or resting or not as present as I would have hoped and tell her stories about our life together, the journeys we had had, because I believe that on some level she would have known that I was there and I couldn't, I couldn't be there. And that was really hard. And I know that I am not the only one who has had that experience, unfortunately, but what I do know is that my practice of being is allowing me to sit with that grief and sit in the heartbreak of her being gone so that sooner than I think, I'll be able to tell stories about her without the tears. I will be able to remember her with the joy and the love and the sparkle of who she was. Because as a culture, we're not very good with grieving. And so often, so often, we take people who have passed and we stop talking about them because it's too painful. But if we practice being and allow ourselves to feel all of this, then we'll be able to get to the other side where all of the beauty that person brought can come forward with us. So before I go further down that rabbit hole, I'm gonna pull myself back together and ask you a very important question, which is why will you be? There's something that attracted you to this session. There is something that is the reason for you to be here. And before we go into the practices of being, I want you to really think about why you're here. Why will you be? Why will you take the time to do this? Why did you show up to spend this time together? Why will you be? So I'm going to pause. You're going to write something down. I recommend with a pen and paper, but you can go, you can type it on your computer, you can write it out on your phone. I'm gonna give you two minutes to get that paper and also write your answer. Why will you be? I hope you're writing things down because we're not in the being experience yet. We're in the reflection part now. I 
And for those of you who are looking for a cheat sheet, I just gave you all of my reasons for why I have a being practice. But what we know is that when we know why we're going to do something, when we know what it brings to our life, we are more likely to stay committed. And my hope, my goal, my intention today is not just to have an experience for us together, but for it to be something that if it serves your life, that you continue with. So about 30 more seconds. All right, so now that you know why you're here, you know why I'm here, we're gonna go to the next part of our time together. And we are gonna do six different practices of beings for three minutes each. So why are we doing it this way? Well, as I already told you, I didn't think that sitting for 30 minutes at a time was going to work out so well, especially virtually. And what I know is that my being practice might not be your being practice. You might need a different flavor. So I wanted to create moments that you could sit through that as someone who is new to a being practice is going to be able to sustain to also see and try what feels right for your system. Because I want you to have a practice that works for you, not what works for me, because that won't actually change your life. So Six practices, three minutes each, and we're gonna do some reflection. So keep that paper and pen nearby because I want you to really think about how each of these things feel for you. So the first one we're gonna do is a walking meditation. Now, I tend to think of a walking meditation as something that happens out in the world, usually in the forest where there are trees and nature and all of those things, yet we don't always have that. So while you are in whatever space you are in, I want you to stand up where you are and we're gonna do a walking meditation together. You don't need much room. You need maybe three feet, but also if you can't stand, just do it from sitting because it's gonna be about looking and recognizing. The concept of the walking meditation is to slow down and see what is around us because so often, especially in our own homes, we habituate to what we see around us and don't actually notice all of the beautiful things that we have used to create a home. So with that, let's start our walking meditation. So stand up and turn to your right. Just turn to your right and pick up one foot really slowly and mindfully and put it back down so you're just a little further from whatever electronic device you're chatting with me on and put your foot down. Notice how that feels in your body. Did your foot feel heavy as it went down? Did it go onto something hard, like a hardwood floor or a plush carpet? Was it smooth or a little bit rough for you? How'd it feel? And as you take that step, I want you to look down. There are your feet. They've been there all along, but how often do we really stop and look at them? And what are they resting on? Is there a pattern on the floor below you? Maybe a carpet whose pattern you rarely notice, or for me, the grain of the hardwood floor is actually quite beautiful. So for a moment, just notice what's below your feet, how it looks, how it feels. And now take another step in the same direction, but this time I want you to look up to that space right between where the ceiling and the wall meets. What's up there? For me, there's crown molding. Again, that's actually quite lovely, even though I rarely notice it. What's up there for you? Does the wall color change to a ceiling color? Is there artwork up on a ledge? Or is it simply a plain wall there that you can acknowledge has been holding up the wall all this time? Now bring your gaze back down to eye level and turn 
all the way around so you're moving to your left. 180 degrees, nice and slow. And pick up your feet to move in that direction as well, slowly, so that you can feel as your feet hit the ground. And what's in your line of sight now that you're looking to the left? Is there artwork? Is there a bookshelf? What's there that you actually haven't looked at in a very long time? For me, there's artwork on the wall that has writing that I haven't actually intentionally read in ages. Is there something maybe that you're grateful is in your line of sight at the moment, or maybe it's time to move? Don't know, but just notice because we're looking and we're seeing. Now with one more step, I want you to come back to center. What does it feel like to have your feet on the floor again? And what is directly in front of you past the screen where you see me? What's back there? What's on the other side? What beautiful thing or in your home or out in the world that you can appreciate is, is there? Now, with that, come back to your seat or your position, however you are most comfortable as we step out of our walking meditation. How did that feel for you? What was that like to slow down and really look at what was around you? On that piece of paper that you have, write down three words, three words of what that was like how it felt. Would you like to do it again for longer? Was three minutes just the right amount of time for you to walk and meditate in place? Just notice if this is something you'd want to do again, or if that was enough for you. So make sure you get your three words down and give you a few moments. All right, so you may have noticed that this is not a very interactive workshop, but it's very experiential. And that was designed intentionally. I want it to be an experience for you. And I also wanted to make sure that you understood why it is experiential and not interactive. It was not a technology limitation as, as we have learned Technology can do almost anything we need it to do. I wanted it to be experiential because being is an individual experience. It is a solo experience. I can't help you actually be. We can be in the same room. We can be in the same space. We can be at the same time. But what you are going through in your body, in your system, in your mind, I can't change. And I can't navigate for you. And I, I can't tell you what your inner wisdom is. It has to be yours. And so while part of TEDx events is, is the amazing connections we make for this moment, I wanted you to make those amazing connections with yourself. What feels really good to you? Not judging against how it felt for somebody else in the chat. What, which of these exercises resonates most for you? not with somebody else in the chat. So it's personal. And we all have to do our own journey of being. So I wanted this to have that flavor for you. I wanted to make sure you knew that so that you recognize that as you move forward from this idea shop, you realize that when you go into your being practice, it is your practice alone for you and by yourself, even if it is to support others around you, as we talked about with community. Okay. Second experience we're going to have is a body scan. And this is a kinesthetic experience. It's about how we feel in our body. So you can do it ideally either lying down or sitting with your feet straight. You don't want to have your legs crossed for this. So you can each feel each leg separately and your arms just by your side. So we're going to do again, these are three minute experiences. So I'm going to walk you through it 
And when you're ready, just let your eyes close. Take a deep breath in and settle into your body. We're going to start at our feet. So wiggle your toes. How do your feet feel? Are they warm? Are they a little cold? Do you have soft socks on that you can feel against them? Or the smoothness of the floor? What sensations do you connect to with your feet? And then come up your legs, your calves. Is there a difference between the left side and the right side of your calves? Or do they both feel pretty consistent? Can you feel the clothes against your body if you are wearing pants or a skirt? Maybe you have a blanket over your legs. What do you feel on the outside and the inside of your legs? Moving up to your thighs. Can you feel the muscles that are helping hold your body in a particular position? And with a deep breath, just let them go and relax. Is there soreness if you've been working out lately? Or like me who hasn't been working out lately, can you feel the softness in your thighs, in your body? No judgment, just seeing. Are there spots that feel more intense than others? Now let's keep moving up to your, to your belly and your low back, that whole low midsection of your torso. How does that feel? Have you been snacking and your belly feels nice and full? Is there a little bit of soreness anywhere in there because it's been a day of sitting? Is there grumbling in your belly because it's almost time for dinner? And let's move up to your your solar plexus in your chest. Take a deep breath in and feel your ribs expand. And then let it out. How does that change how your chest feels? How the back of your shoulders feel against the chair or the floor? Can you feel places where there's a little bit of a knot or a little bit of openness after taking those deep breaths? And follow your chest down your arms. What do your arms and your hands feel like? Can you feel the fabric against your body? Is there a breeze in the air that you can feel on your hands and arms? Any tingling or sparkling in your hands and arms? And come back up through your neck to your jaw and your head. So many of us carry tension there. Do you? No judgment, just can you let it go with a breath? Can you relax the muscles in your face? And can you take one last deep breath as we move up past your head and let it go? And now open your eyes. Come on back. And so I ask again, how did that feel? What was that experience like for you? Is it something you'd want to do again? Or was that one time enough? So again, on your piece of paper, write down three words, three words that describe what this body scan felt like for you. Hmm. For me, a body scan always makes me feel connected again. I love that sensation. And there are lots of body scans done in all different ways. Some people go top to bottom. I tend to go bottom to top. It's a practice that I sometimes do when I'm about to walk into a difficult situation just so that I can feel myself and be present that I can do in, in a minute on the street. But there are also meditations that will walk you to, through a 30 minute body scan that is really slow and delicious, lets you melt away is that kinesthetic kind of being something that'd be really powerful for you? Maybe, could be, some of the time at least anyway. So we've now had three different experiences of being. And I just wanna ask you, what might you be feeling? What's coming up for you? 
one of the barriers that I find to having a being practice, and one of the things that has felt really challenging for me in the beginning was all of the different things that come up. Because let's be honest, if having a being practice meant that we always felt connected and delicious and joyful, and we walked out and we were like, I am inspired, this is great. Well, we would all have a being practice all of the time. And, and are there moments where that happens? Yes, for sure. For me, that hasn't been the majority of the time. Some of the other things that I sometimes feel, just to give you an idea, is sometimes I feel bored and I get in a thought loop of I'm wasting my time and this is ridiculous and what am I doing? Sometimes I'm really tired and I find that I put my head down and all of a sudden the 30 minute timer goes off and I'm like, oh, and I fell asleep. Now I've decided for me, that's okay because clearly I needed to spend the time resting. Because if you're a doer like I'm a doer, we don't rest enough. And so if that's what I needed with that time, I'm okay with it. Now, the trickier part is those really big hard emotions. The anger, the when I started doing my being practice, the depression, I was just so sad that I would sit there and feel numb and sad and alone. And to sit in that was so uncomfortable. But what I learned was that by sitting in that, it moved. By giving it space, it changed. And that's some of the magic of this type of practice. And so I wanted to make sure that that was on your radar, that this isn't all lovely sparkles, but it will lead there. Because what I found was those moments when I was really uncomfortable, I then had an easier time in the rest of my day because I was allowed to feel those feelings. I gave myself space and permission to do that. And I will tell you this week, some of my practices of being have been the hardest I've ever done. But as I said before, I really believe that going through grief in this way will allow me to bring my beloved friend's memory to life in the future, which I can't do right now. And I think we all need that a little bit more than we give ourselves space for. So I encourage you to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And if we can do it in a space where we have intentionally created it, then it's easier to do in those moments that we didn't create. And let's face it, this past year and a half, reflecting on what we've all gone through individually and as a collective, there have been so many uncomfortable moments. But the more we practice being uncomfortable, the more we can navigate through those with ease and grace. And that, that is the goal here. Yeah, you with me? You, ha you sure? You ready for another experience? Okay, let's be again. So we're gonna have an experience that is a little bit more stillness a little more quiet from me. And you're gonna sit in a way that is comfortable for you. My suggestion would be to have your feet flat on the floor, not crossed, sitting up with a straight back. But your comfort is more important than following my directions. And I want you to listen for three sounds, three sounds that you hear during these three minutes. Now, if there are a whole lot of sounds that I want you to think of the ones that surprise you, but what do you hear? Ideally, your eyes are gonna be closed so that you can really focus. When we close one sense, other sense get heightened. So close your eyes, take a deep breath, and listen.
right and that was three minutes so slowly open your eyes come back to the room and on your piece of paper write down what were three sounds that you heard for me i can hear there's a food truck on the corner of my street that i can hear the engine running living in an apartment building in new york city i heard somebody leaving which with their recycling i could hear the bottles clanking in the hallway and then i had to listen really hard to find another sound because i was like well that's that's it that's all i got um but then of course underneath that when i stopped and got quiet i can hear the humming of my lights so those were my three sounds now of course there were other little things that popped up those were the three main ones so write down yours and how was this experience how was that silence for three minutes? How was that stillness for three minutes for you? With that focus on what you're hearing. So I want you to pay attention to that. Is this something you'd wanna do again? Was it uncomfortable? Did it stretch you a little bit? Is that maybe what you need and what would be good for you or was it too much of a stretch and not actually what you need? Only you know that answer. So write down on your sheet what, what you think of this experience for you. For you. Personally, I love this one. But you have to decide what's right for you. That stillness feels really good to me. Now, in contrast, there is sometimes we need to move. We need to shake. We need to boogie it out, right? And if you have pets, if you have animals, if you have um, been in nature or watched a nature show, you see that after something scary or hard or big happens with your animal, they'll shake it out, right? That's how they get rid of their trauma. That's how they get rid of that fear. We as humans go into the same flight or fight response, but we logic and reason our way through it and we think through it. When the truth is our bodies still have this a, a similar, not the same, but a similar hormonal response. And so one way of being for people who are very physical is to shake it out, to shake it out, shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. So yes, we are gonna shake it out for three minutes because we wanna dislodge whatever is stuck. We wanna move it out and it will feel silly and it will feel weird and it will feel awkward and you need to remember that I am the one on camera, not you. And if I can do it, you can do it. So stand up. Come on. You're going to get up with me. I'm setting the timer. And we are going to shake it out for three minutes. You can go fast. You can go slow. You can go big. You can go small. But we're going to move. Ready, set, shake. Just, just like that. For me, I usually start just on my heels. Shake my head a little, wiggle my arms out, right? You can do a little bit of a wiggle. Back on my heels and bow. Do you hear that? Uh, maybe it'll feel good for you. I hope I'm not shaking the computer, but I might be, so my apologies for that. Um, just open your jaw and let sound come out. Uh, let that be part of your shaking experience. Yep. Now let my head go, let your head go, let your arms go. Maybe it's more wiggly for you. Wiggle, 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 wiggle. Oh yeah, the joys of curly, long hair. Got you. But it doesn't matter because it's not about looking good. It's about being in it. And it feels kind of silly. And I kind of like it. And if you have kids, you should invite them in to wiggle with you, to shake it out. You can close your eyes. Might help you feel less self-conscious. You can move around a little. See how that feels. Different spots on your floor. Yep, shake. Shake it out. Let it go. Come on, I'm still doing it. Make sure you're still up shaking with me. Shake. Uh, make some weird sounds. Let that out too. Uh, I'm getting a little breathless. I don't know if you are. 
we're just about halfway through. Keep going. Uh, maybe you're silent when you shake. I don't know. Shake. Yep. It's getting warm, at least in my place. It's getting warm for you too. As we move our body, we get heat. It's part of it. You shaking? How's it feel? I like the music my necklace is making. I think that's kind of funny. Shake it out, 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 shake it out. We go. 30 more seconds. Shaking, 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 shake, shake it out. Shake it out, shake it out, shake it out, 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 out. Shake it out, shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. Oh yeah. Keep going. We're not done yet. Keep going. Shake it out. Shake it out. <sighs> and three, two, one. You did it. So, woo! All right. How was that for you? I want you to write down three words of how that experience felt because. I love this one too. Now, granted, I'm a little biased. I'm probably only doing experiences. Sorry, there's from shaking. I like have hair that is now stuck on my face. Um, okay, it's all gone. We're clear now. Um, I'm only doing experiences that I actually love, experiences of being that I love. But your reflection, what did that feel like for you? Was it freeing? Did it feel like you let something go that you've been holding on to? often how I feel after I shake for a while. Did you have another creature around, be it human or animal, that was kind of like, what are you doing? Y'all right over there? Is everything okay? You good? Um, did you have kids that came in the room and started laughing with you or shaking with you? For me, it always feels like I have so much more space in my body after I do this kind of exercise. And it's hot and I'm breathless and that feels good too. Right, that feels like I moved something and I love that. So this might be your being practice that is the right place for you to start because that stillness isn't your flavor. You gotta find what's gonna work for you. So now with that, there is no right way to be. Those of us who are master doers, right? I'm putting you in that category with me because I have a feeling you might be. Those of us who are master doers want to do it right. We want to get it correct. We want to make sure that we have accomplished our goal. We kind of want to do it perfectly, even though some of us will never admit it. I don't call myself a perfectionist. I've never thought of myself as a perfectionist yet. You better believe I probably am. When it comes to being, there's a freeness of it because there is no right way to be. There is no correct system for being. You're not gonna get it wrong. You didn't shake incorrectly. If you had to take a break, that's fine. If during the three minutes of listening for something, you got distracted because you could hear on the audio, my neighbor bringing down their recycling and you opened your eyes to see what was happening, you didn't do it wrong. That was just your experience, this time of being. There's not a perfection in doing it because it changes every time based on where you're at and what your system needs. For me, that feels like freedom. That is opening a space where it feels easier to do things imperfectly because I have practiced being in this imperfect space. Falling asleep in the middle of practicing being really pushed all my buttons, but I wasn't supposed to do it right, so I did the way it came. And that has led to doors that I didn't think were going to open in my own thought process. So if you are a perfectionist like me, whether you admit it or not, see it or not, remember that being does not have a perfect form. That's why we got lots of options that we're going through today. Like this one. This is our fifth one if you're counting. Okay, so we have this and one more. So box breathing. We're gonna have every section of it be the same amount. So it's gonna be a count of four. 
You don't have to worry. I'm going to do the counting so you can just breathe. We're going to inhale for a count of four. We're going to hold for a count of four. Then you exhale for a count of four. And then you hold for a count of four. And then you do it again and again and again. We're only doing it for three minutes. Now, if you have an experience in breath work, if that's part of what you know, you can make it a longer number, right? It's not about it being four. It can be five. It can be 10. You can inhale for 10, hold for 10, exhale for 10, hold for 10. It's about every piece being even, not the number you pick. If this is new for you, if this is the first time you've ever heard of this, never practice intentional breathing, after one minute, you might need to stop because it feels different and you might get out of breath. So whatever it is that you need to do to make this practice work, remember, there's no way to do it perfectly. It's just an experience of being. So I have these little handy dandy cards and I'm going to say, ooh, other one, inhale, hold, exhale, hold. Okay. And I'm going to keep rotating through until the timer goes off for three minutes. And this is the box breathing experience of um, being. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. All right, ready, let's go. So inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, Hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold, exhale, hold. Inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold, exhale. Hold, inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold. Exhale, hold, inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold. Exhale, hold, inhale, and breathe normally. So how is that? There's an evenness in that breath that has a deep impact on our system. So what did that feel like for you? Was it soothing? Was it calming? Did it require too much thought to pay attention to what I was saying? 
different experiences for different people. So I want you to write down three things on your piece of paper that the breath box, the breath box, no, I did that backwards. The box of breath did for you. How'd that feel? Is this something you want to do again? How is that? What do you think? Is this your way of being felt really good in your system? All right. Now, our final way of being is going to be in stillness. So we all go on vacation and just want to sit and look at the ocean because it is a way of being where we feel like we're allowed to just sit and be. So this feels like the type of being that I practice, which may or may not be right for you. So we're gonna play a video for three minutes and I just want you to sit and watch and listen to the ocean and the waves. All your, your entire job is to watch this video. So Jonathan, if you can play this video now, that'd be awesome. All right, how was that? Hopefully you were able to turn the volume up and hear the waves as well as see the waves, but how do you feel after three minutes of stillness? Is that your way of being? Whether it is actually getting yourself to the ocean, which if you can do that on a regular basis, I am jealous. Maybe it's watching a video. There are many, many, many of them on YouTube of just setting it up and setting a timer for 10 minutes and watching the waves. Or maybe it's that idea of stillness, but you do it in your space 
watching the trees outside your window or staring at a wall the way I do. But how did stillness feel to you? So write down on your piece of paper three words to describe how you feel after this practice of stillness. Is this the one for you? Personally, I feel delicious. I feel calm. I feel um, open. Right? That's how I feel after watching those waves. So those are our six practices. Now, now is the really fun part to me. Because now that you have practiced stillness, now that we know what it feels like, you've experienced it, you have some notes on exactly how it's going to feel for you, it's time to go into the world. But if you go into the world and this is all we've done, then this will have just been a really lovely idea shop and you're not going to actually make any lasting change. And one of my missions in the world is to create lasting change for humans. So we need to figure out how to do that, which means if you're like me, you like that, I put in a clearing slide just so that we had some space there. Um, if you're like me, we have to treat this being like a doing because we do, we do so well. We, we can get things done. We can accomplish, we can do something. So being sometimes becomes this little bit of amorphous. We're like, oh yeah, I'll get there. I'll do that mindfulness practice sometime when I get there, right? It doesn't go on a calendar. It doesn't get scheduled. So really to integrate this practice of being into your life, to make this something that can be really impactful, we need to treat it as an action. So, we're gonna walk through some steps and I'm gonna tell you a secret. These steps will help you change to bring being into your life. They might also help for any other behavior change that you wanna make. But for right now, we're just gonna talk about the being, but know that this is a great tool across the board. So first and foremost, how will you be? Which of these experiences do you want to set up as your practice? That heart coherence, that very first thing we did with our hands on our heart and just breathing for a few minutes, is that what you wanna do? Do you wanna do a walking meditation or a body scan? Do you wanna sit and listen and see what sounds you hear? Do you wanna shake it off? Or do a box breath? Or do you wanna sit with the stillness of the ocean? Which one, just pick one, I know if you're ambitious, you're going to pick like three or four, but just one for now. You can pick more later. And if you tend to be indecisive, as some of us tend to be, you can pick one later and then change your mind. You're not stuck with it. But what one are you going to do? Write it down. Because if you don't write it down, you'll forget. It's been a big day. Tomorrow, lots more will happen. So write it down. So that's the first thing we had to figure out. Now. How long are you going to sit for three minutes the way we did today? Because that felt like a good amount of time. Are you going to sit for 10 minutes? Because you're like, okay, this felt good, but 10 would feel really good. Or do you want to sit for 20? Because you are creating that space. Or is 20 too much? I am a big believer that small steps lead to big behavior change. So please take the small step that is right for you, not because you want to win at being because that's not a thing that's just not a thing do what feels manageable when i was first told to practice being i was told to do it for two hours a day and um that was way too much for me so i do 30 minutes start with three start with 10 how long are you going to be write it down got it write it down okay now when will you be when will you be? Are you going to do it first thing in the morning when you wake up? Are you going to do it after you drop the kids off at school? Are you going to do it after work? Are you going to do it before bed, after dinner? One of the amazing things that I have learned about behavior change is if you are trying to start a new habit, if you link it into something you are already doing, a piece of your schedule that already exists with certainty in your life, it becomes much easier 
to remember to do it and to keep going. If you just like stick it in somewhere and put it on a calendar, you'll forget. But if you put it on your calendar, if you schedule it in connection with something that you already have as a very strong habit, much easier to maintain. So which habit are you going to link it to? I really like doing it in the morning after I shower. I shower, I get dressed, and then I be. Now I'll tell you mornings that I have very early mornings, I don't do it that way, I move it somewhere else. But in general, that is my habit because I like starting my day with that space, with that clarity, with that beingness. It helps me. Maybe you're an evening kind of person. Don't know. Okay, where are you gonna do it? So for me, I told you I sit in that orange chair that's right over there. Sometimes I'm on my couch over there. Where are you gonna do it? Is there a particular space in your house or in your office on your property that you want to do it? Or are you going to be a, pick a practice that you can do anywhere, anytime? You're going to move it around because that feels better for you. I'm not invested in the answer. There is no right answer. I'm invested in you actually picking an answer right now and writing it down. Now, go, do it. Where will it be? Got it? Now, what's your goal, right? We know that when we do things, there's a goal, there's a deadline, there's an accomplishment. We have clarity on our goals, right? So if we're going to practice being, we have to think about what is our goal and not in a outcome because you don't know what will come. That's kind of the excitement and the joy, the curiosity of being is we don't know what's going to happen. Every time I sit down, I don't know if it's going to be all sparkly and excitement at the end of it or if it's going to be a nap one, or if it's going to be challenging, it's a surprise. But a goal as far as our frequency and duration so that we know when we're going to stop and reflect. How long do you want to do this in order to maintain your experience? Because if you do it once, we're not really sure what the impact is, but doing it over time will show us. So there are two different pieces of this, as you can see from the slide. How, what's your frequency? across a week. So for me, my goal is to, to be five days a week because I know I'm gonna miss a couple and I can meet that pretty reliably. Depending on what your life looks like and what your needs are, maybe it's two times a week or four times a week. Maybe that is the rhythm that feels better for you as you start this. And then maybe you start it two times a week and that fits your life and it feels really good. Maybe you have to change it, but pick one and see. And then, at what point are you going to reflect on changing this goal? Is it going to be in a week? Is it going to be in two weeks? Is it going to be in a month? How long do you want to run this experiment to see what impact being has for you? Sounds like a really interesting way to explore what's going on. But that becomes your goal. And if you pick one week, then great. Put on your calendar in a week from now to reevaluate your being practice. Do you want to keep doing it? Do you want to stop? Do you want to change and pick a different experience? Do you want to do it more often or less often or for longer times? All of these variables get to change at that goal date, but not before. You have to give yourself time to settle into new habits. Otherwise, we just jump from thing to thing to thing and we're like, we tried it all and nothing works. <gasps> we have to give ourselves time to adjust to these different experiences. Now, you heard me say that you have to be alone. We have to do it ourselves. We can only do it for ourselves. And that's true. I also know that accountability and celebration is important. So who are you going to be with means, do you have somebody else who's maybe at this event who is listening to this with you, who you guys can agree we're both going to be and we're going to be each other's cheerleaders? Or do you have someone who is beloved, who you can say, I, I want to start this new habit. Will you support me? Can I tell you that I did it? And you encourage me the fact that I did. That, that partnership, that cheerleading is important and powerful for so many of us to make change. So think about who in your life would celebrate that you're doing this or do it with you so that it becomes this like, let's lift each other up and make it even better. Is it your partner? Is it a dear friend? Is it a colleague? You know, lunch hour of being could be super fun. Is it your children? I love the idea of bringing children into being because naturally they are so good at being. And yet you are so good at doing for them. 
So it helps them see and help and support and participate in something that is meaningful for you. Because as adults, we often are doing so much for them, bringing your kiddo into what you are doing, what you are learning, what you are experiencing. Really powerful. So think about that. Who is your person? Write it down. Write their name. Write their name so you know who to go call after this session and say, hey, I need to talk to you about this. Or maybe they're sitting next to you and you can just nudge them and be like, hey, we're going to do this now. Okay? Because that community is so powerful in our practices. And then I just want to tie us back into the beginning because when we remember why we do something, we stick with it. And maybe your why has changed over the course of this experience. That's very possible. Or maybe it is the same. But in the beginning, after I shared with you why I have a being practice, I asked you, why, why will you be? So I want you to either go back to your answer, reread it, check. Is that still true? Is there a different answer? Is there an additional answer? Because write it in now. I'll be quiet for a little bit so you can write in your why. Why will you be? Okay, if you have more to write, keep going, but I'm gonna keep moving us forward. And I want you to know that part of why I practice being is so that I can do things like that. I can have that silence and stillness because that is not part of my nature. And if you knew me as a child, you would know that part of my job as a kid was to talk incessantly when my father had to drive home late at night to keep him awake. They would put me in the front seat and tell me just to talk. So that silence is not something I do naturally but it feels easy now because I have this practice of being. Maybe that's part of why you're gonna be, so you can have more stillness and more quiet. Who knows? All right, now, our words are powerful. So I have three different phrases that I just wanna share with you for you to practice saying so that you can actually be good at being. Because as I was putting together this TEDx and as I was talking to dear people in my life and saying, oh, I'm going to talk about being because I sit for 30 minutes every day and just be. I'm thinking about having people sit for five minutes or 10 minutes or three minutes. And people said, oh, I don't think I could do that. I'm not I'm not sure about this. And a lot of people that I spoke with were hesitant at this idea of being. It felt overwhelming. And so I offer this to you and say it with me is I spend time every day being. When we tell ourselves things, especially in the positive, it is more likely that it will happen. I spend time every day being. I spend time every day being. I spend time every day being. The more you tell yourself this, the easier it will be to spend time every day being. You will manifest it into reality. I am good at being. I'm good at being. I can do this because I'm good at being. I'm good at being. Again, the more you say this, the more likely it is to be true. And the final one is, I am worthy of taking time to be. You are worthy of this. And part of what stops so many of us from actually being, from doing these practices, from stopping all of our doingness is because we attach our worthiness to what we do in the world, to what we produce in the world, to our outcomes. And if the only place you feel worthy is in your doing, you need this practice. You need time doing because I have been there and it is not enough to sustain your entire life because you are worthy of being and you are worthy of taking time for yourself. So the phrase is, I am worthy of taking time to be. I am worthy of taking time to be. I am worthy of taking time to be. It's just as important as everything that you do for everybody else. You are worthy of taking time to be. So I have two final pieces. One is I believe that celebration is powerful for changing any behavior. Anything we want to bring in, we celebrate every time we do it. So after every practice, I want you to celebrate that you experienced being. 
that you sat, that you walked, that you shook, that you were there, that you took that time because you are worthy of it. And so all, I just want to take a moment to celebrate you and say, you did it. Oh, yes, you did it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You did it. You experienced being in so many different ways today. And I am so grateful that you stayed with me, that you did it, that you showed up for yourself and that you gave me the gift of your time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are amazing. And my final, therefore, gift for you is a permission slip. Because sometimes we need a reminder that we really can sit and be. So I encourage you to take a screenshot to, um, to freeze frame and take this down because it's a permission slip that says, I give myself permission to be each and every day. I will integrate moments of being into my life with kindness and compassion. I am worthy of this time. I know that being more will allow me to be more. Print it out, sign it, and date it, and know that you are not alone in this journey, that I am here and witnessed it with you. But take that with you. Make it the screensaver to your phone so that you remember how powerful being can be. And with that, I say thank you, and together we will all be more so that we can be more. I do believe that there is now a TEDx Naperville video Naperville, oh my goodness, TEDx Naperville video. This is how you know I am not from the area, I'm a New Yorker. Na TEDx Naperville video for you all to see. Hey, hey, virtual guys, it's Arthur Zards. I'm back here at the Idea Shop with the people that are in person. Hey, thanks so much for being part of the, uh, the virtual audience. I wish I could be there with you guys. Uh, I will be watching some of the loops for the speakers. I heard that the, the workshops were really incredible. I heard, I heard most of you danced, I hope you all, all did. Uh, I want to thank Silver for setting this up, and thanks Jonathan for the setting up the virtual. But thanks for being part of the the event uh, today. It really is special for us. I wish I could be there in person to see everybody, but I'll, we'll see you soon. And look forward to more uh, virtual programming uh, this winter. Thanks so much. <laughs>